Have you ever wondered how it is that Demogorgon came to have two heads, or how the name Rimon has passed into ancient memory? You'll find the answer to these questions and more in today's episode of Monster of the Week. Hello and welcome to a brand new episode of Monster of the Week, the show where we dig up old creatures from past editions of Dungeons and Dragons and bring them to light for use in your current 5th edition games. I'm your host, Josiah, also known as Dungeon Dad, and today we're going to be going back to 4th edition to take a look at a creature or group of creatures, rather, from the 3rd Monster Manual. In this book under A for Apocalypse, we have a group of creatures known as Apocalypse Spells. The whole idea with these creatures is that when a god or powerful demon or some crazy powerful being on a grand scale were to cast some kind of spell that was world shattering and very much an apocalyptic scale spell that the resulting energies left over would actually manifest into living creatures. And one such spell was cast by the god Amoth. As the story goes, his keep on the plain of Kalenduran was being assaulted by Orcus, Demogorgon, and Rimon, three elder evils from the abyss. Finding himself cornered, Amoth did the one thing that he could do and cast a very powerful self-sacrificing spell to try and annihilate all three of these creatures at once. In doing so, he was also able to split Demogorgon's head in twain, which is why we now have the two-headed Demogorgon we all know and love and fear. But the result of this spell was that it only ended up killing Rimon. Both Orcus and Demogorgon, as they are still alive in the current lore, were able to actually shield themselves behind this third demon lord, which resulted in his destruction. So both Amoth and Rimon were destroyed, and the plane of Kalenduran was absorbed into the abyss. Now after decades passed, the residual energy that was left behind in this blasted battlefield began to rise and form into these creatures. These creatures contained both the cold and radiant energy of Amoth, along with the powerful malice and anger of the demon lord Rimon. Coalescing into many single individual creatures, this gave birth to the first Lights of Amoth. These massive elementals are truly forces to be reckoned with on the battlefield, and today I'm going to tell you just about what they do in battle, and of course some ways that you can use them in your game. So bundle up in your best cold resistant gear, because it's time for... So these guys don't have the highest armor class in the world, but what they do have is a ton of hit points. They're very physically strong and incredibly beefy, however they do rely primarily on melee attacks. Their main offensive tool is an ability called Fist of Wrath, which is just basically a slam attack that has a 10 foot reach, and it causes a fair amount of cold and bludgeoning damage. There are themes of vengeance and destruction at the very core of this creature, it very much sells what it's all about. And this is all just accentuated by an ability it has called Wave of Retribution. Basically the way this works is anytime it takes a damage, it deals 1d10 cold damage to all other creatures within 10 feet of it. This is really interesting to me because yes, it's just a little bit of extra damage taxing the player's hit points, but it also encourages a certain type of play. Rather than using spells like Magic Missile or hitting it with a bunch of successive attacks that do a lot of damage over a great number of hits, because you don't want to be taking a d10 cold damage or have your allies take that damage every time it takes a source of damage like a Magic Missile, instead it encourages single attacks that do a ton of damage all in one hit, like a Paladin's Smite or a Fireball. And the extra cold damage isn't necessarily going to make this creature that much more powerful, but it's definitely going to push your players to a certain style of attack, at least if they want to avoid taking some extra unnecessary damage. And playing into this theme of retribution and dealing back whatever harm was dealt to it, it's almost always going to be going after the person who has dealt the most damage to it thus far, which will add a layer of predictability to the creature if your players manage to figure that out. And it also has another trait called Unfettered Apocalypse that basically is worded so whenever this creature goes down to 50% of its hit points, or when it takes a critical hit, a chunk of it basically bursts off and forms another creature that is an exact copy of the original. Now it can only do this once per day, and the second creature only lasts for 1d4 rounds, but your players don't necessarily know that. And having between 1 and 4 rounds of another one of these things out on the battlefield can be absolutely devastating to a party if they don't handle it properly. And the next copy might even take a few attacks that the original one should be taking, because the party might not necessarily know that it's temporary. The other thing here too is the party doesn't know that it can only do this once per day, so if they score a critical hit against it and see a piece of it burst off and then form another creature, maybe they'll think that's what will happen every time, Ultimately, this kind of leaves a bit of a puzzle within the combat encounter for the party to solve, and it can create some very tense and dramatic moments. 
Now, as I mentioned previously, it has two fist attacks, which are quite powerful, but it also has an ability called Legacy of Kalenduran that allows it to make a fist attack against every creature within range. Now, this ability is on a recharge of six, so it's not going to be doing this every single round unless your players are very unlucky, but it is kind of its main thing. It's just going to be thrashing around and punching and smashing everything that it can get its hands on. And as a very last resort, it can reach inside itself and unleash a blast of cold energy that does a fair amount of cold damage. And of course, the players get a save to try to take half damage on it. And also, if they fail their save, it can paralyze them. Now, this is only once a day that it can do this, but if it hits enough of the party with this attack, it can be a huge game changer. Now, these guys basically have no options when it comes to ranged attacks, but they make up for it by being absolute monsters when it comes to hand-to-hand -to -hand battles. They would definitely work better as minions for some kind of wizard or monster that can cast spells, which is going to get us into some. As I was just saying, these creatures can make excellent minions for any type of caster, even demons, devils, angels, whatever. While they do crave destruction, they are also smart, and they'll cut a deal if they feel that they either have to or if it's in their best interest. So because of this, they can be found among the ranks of all creatures that you might find in the Astral Sea. They could even be working with Mind Flayers, or Gith Yankee, maybe even Gith Zerai. Or maybe they're even working with the Gif, the hippo people from Mordenkainen's Tome of Foes. Despite how similar their names sound, the Gif and Gith are very different. And speaking of Mordenkainen's Tome of Foes, if you read it, then you know that these guys would make an excellent pairing with all manner of different devils. They're prime candidates for the whole blood war situation that's happening in the Abyss because of their natural hatred of demons that comes from the part of them that used to be part of Amoth. They could also just make good wandering monster encounters in the Astral Sea or anywhere that has to do with powerful spells, magic, and elementals. And if you happen to have an adventure that's set in the blasted plain of Kalenduran or what's left of it or whatever the equivalent in your world is, these guys are the obvious choice for denizens of that place. And honestly, if you like these creatures but aren't huge on the lore and backstory, you could really just forgo all of that and use them as giant crystalline ice monsters. Or just rewrite the backstory. If you like the idea of this creature as an apocalypse spell being the remnants of some powerful magic cast millennia ago, but you don't have those demon lords or Amoth in your pantheon or your world's history, then just make up your own story about what spell was cast to create these creatures. And that's what I think is so neat about the Light of Amoth and all the other Apocalypse spells, is they make us ask questions. They can add a lot to your world and be used as key storytelling components just by their very existence alone. And because of that, I think they belong in almost any setting, even if you have to change up the story to make it fit with whatever deities and pantheon you have going on in the background of your game. If you've ever had these creatures used on you or you plan on using them in the future, definitely tell me about it. I draw so much inspiration from the comment section of these videos. There's always great ideas floating around there. And let me know if you like this creature and you'd like to see other creatures like it because there are other apocalypse spells that are pretty interesting and I wouldn't mind covering some more of them in the future. So definitely let me know what you think about them there. And of course, if you do want to run this creature, everything you will need for it can be found in the Google document, which is linked in the description below this video. And if you are one of my lovely patrons, you will already have have in your hands the stat block that is done in the style of the monster manual, which can be found on the Patreon page as well as the uh, Google Drive folder there too. Anyways, thank you guys so much for watching. I really do appreciate it and I'll see you in the next video. Until then.